But it's my pleasure now to be able to introduce Dan Grinspin from University of Washington, who's working on his PhD uh, in anthropology. He's really a biological sciences educator as well, so there's this theme here. But he's going to talk about also something that's, I think, near and dear to our hearts, or which are issues of equity and diversity around gender. So uh, Dan has been uh, recently published a paper, as I recall, that's generated a whole lot of buzz. And this is really about some of the work that he's going to be talking about. So Dan, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, when I got invited to do this, I was like, that is the coolest thing. I would absolutely love to come and talk to this community about this research. Um, then I found out Kimberly was presenting this morning, and then I found out today and like exactly what she was presenting, and I just got so buzzed because it is everything that is you want to be hearing before and I think after this work. So these two really go well together. Um, I'm really excited about that. So my title is Old Boys Club Starts Early. Uh, we're, gonna un we're gonna investigate uh, how males are underestimating their female peers in biology classrooms. And this is gonna be much more of a research talk and less building mobiles. Uh, so bear with me, it won't be as fun. Uh, so I wanna talk to you about gender and biology. Uh, before I talk about gender and biology, I want to make a quick note about the word gender. As I use it in this talk, I am going to be talking to you about binary genders. This is constrained largely by how data that we got have been collected. Uh, the University of Washington, when students come in, say, list us your, or tell us your gender, it's male or female. What we do understand is that gender is not a binary, it exists on a spectrum. So excuse me as I use gender in the binary, but no that we don't necessarily understand it as one, but it simplifies how we can do our analyses. Biology is often overlooked when we start talking about gender issues, and there's pretty good reason for this. If you've ever walked into a biology classroom at an undergraduate level uh, at a co-ed institution, you'll notice that there's usually a female majority. You go in, and this is a very female-friendly field at the undergraduate level. In fact, if you look at who is earning bachelor degrees in biological sciences, about 59% of, ba of bachelor degrees in biological sciences are going to females. This seems great. Even when we look at the graduate level, 52% of masters and PhDs in biological sciences are going to females. This is, to me, right, if I look at this, I see, okay, we are equity, and if anything, females are kicking butt here. We start seeing problems once you go further, once you start looking at who are the postdocs, who are the practicing biologists with PhD in hand, all of a sudden we see this pretty clear linear trend. This has often at this point been referred to as this leaky pipeline, where as you go further and further along this route, decisions are being made that differ between males and females, where maybe the decision to persist is easier or different for one gender than the other. So the broad question that we want to talk about today is what's contributing to this leaky pipeline in biology, and of course not just biology, but we can think about any of the STEM fields. Right? Biology, we think, is probably going to be a conservative case because we see so many females there. And I want to start by asking you to consider two questions. I'm going to make you do number one on that list. I'm going to make you do a think-pair-share. I want you to think to yourself, how do you know that you are good at something? Think about something that you know you are good at. We are all good at something, probably several things. And I want you to know, how have you come to that realization? How do you know that you, you're good at that? And then I want you to think about something that you're not good at. Maybe something that you wish you were good at, or one time, like some time ago, you were trying to be good at, and then came to the conclusion, no, I'm not good at this, or something that you haven't tried yet. But think for 30 seconds silently to yourself, how do I know I'm good at this? How do I know I'm not good at this? And then I want you to talk with your peers at your table about what are your indicators. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, I am going to cut everybody off right there. Okay, I am going to learn. I'm going to use something that I actually learned. I've never done this before. I'm going to collect four hands. I'm going to get four responses. Okay. Okay, how about these four? And we'll do what I just learned. We're going to start with the last person to volunteer. Um, and speak to your colleagues, not to me. We, okay. Um, we were talking um, about. Knowing, knowing you're good at something comes from uh, your comfort level in it, um, but it can be kind of subjective. Um, also with um, comparing your results with the results of others, as well as um, positive feedback, either vocal or um, like noted um, in a grade or something like that. Um, and when you know you're not good at something, I think it comes from like failure and looking at the way somebody else did something and your results not being as, as good as theirs. OK, so I'm hearing a lot of you need that comparison, right? We need to see what somebody else is doing, what someone else is giving us as feedback. Thank you. Tommaso? I thought of it, as I thought about this, I realized that I think I know I'm good at something when I get external validation from it, like somebody who I think knows more than me about something might clarify that I'm good at something. I'm mm -hmm. way more likely to think I'm not good without any external validation. So again, similar theme, right? This external validation, what somebody else thinks. Thank um, you. For me, it's a lot of uh, comparing myself directly to others, comparing my results to my actions directly to others, whether it's like, uh, and I'm good at something because I'm like, my stats are higher than other people, whether it's like me to like physically watching it or me comparing my own statistics to others. Like, I know I'm really bad at bowling because everybody else is better at it than I am. <laughs> everybody else knocks down more pins every time. So, like, basically just directly comparing myself. Mm -hmm. So again, just this comparison, the social comparison. Thank you. I'm going to go over here. Uh, things that I'm good at, people tell me I'm really good at them. Things that I'm not good at, I've noticed I don't get invited to do certain things. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. This, okay, so every single answer, the big common theme is what are the social signals that I am getting from around me that are telling me that I'm good at something or I'm not good at something. I really like this quote by Henry Ford. Whether you think you can or you can't, you're probably right. And I don't know if Henry Ford was meaning to get at this, but he's really getting at the root of something that we like to call self-efficacy, which is your belief in your ability to succeed at some sort of task. And you may be thinking, I've heard this before, possibly as a child, because this is the whole parable behind sort of the little engine that could, because our behaviors are often influenced by those beliefs that we hold about ourselves. So if we have some arduous task that we need to do, right, this little engine is telling itself, I think I can, I think I can the whole way. But perhaps if it's telling itself, I think I can't, it's probably not going to make it. It's probably going to not get there, even if it could. Really importantly, as we all just self-discovered with our peers, 
self-efficacy can really be impacted by our social influences, right? We found out, okay, when I know I'm good at something, it's because someone told me that I'm good at it. It's because I see that I'm doing better than other people, right? So we can lift our self-efficacy, we can know that we're good at something, but we can also really erode it, right? Being told that you're not good at something hurts. That doesn't feel good. That makes you think that you're not good at it anymore. That can really lead to quitting. So I want to go back to what our broad question is, is what's contributing to this leaky pipeline in biology? Not just biology, but across STEM fields. Biology tends to start with the highest percent. And today we really want to start focusing on social influences. And we're going to focus specifically today on gender, but you can think about inequities that may be going on with social influences with any other parts of your identity. And when we think about undergraduates, we can think about two main sources where they're getting these social influences. They have their faculty, as Tommaso pointed out, right? Being told by someone that you look up to can be really impactful. But we also heard a lot about how seeing what your peers are doing can be really impactful. So I wanna just quickly go through a couple studies that have been done looking at faculty bias. Um, this was an audit study where they looked with a sample of biology, chemistry, and phys uh, physics faculty. They split this into public universities and private universities to kind of get at the different kinds of cultures. And they emailed these professors as if they were a student asking for a recommendation letter. So they're asking, can you evaluate me? And they sent an identical email, they sent an identical resume, identical everything. But some of those emails came from John. Some of those emails came from Jennifer. And they could look and see how do faculty evaluate these students. And what I want you to do with your table is fill in what your hypothesis is of what they found in the study. So here, this is gonna be two bars for how competent they thought John was versus Jennifer. These two bars are gonna be higher ability of John versus Jennifer, and this is gonna be how much mentoring they offered to John and Jen Jennifer. So make your prediction. Was there any difference between the male student asking for a recommendation and the female student asking for a recommendation and how the faculty responded? Talk to your neighbors. This is across all the professors. They looked at the average, essentially, in the standard error of what John got and what Jennifer got. So this is across all three, not split by field. And not split by field, not split by gender of the professor they asked. This is also not split by the gender of the professor that they asked. Good question. What's the hypothesis here? Well, we were thinking maybe there was a maybe a ten percent difference leaning in the favor of males. In one of them and all of them? Most likely all of them. Most likely all of them. Okay. But did they take real students that the faculty were interacting with and put fake names on them? Mm-mm. They assess mentoring then. They is I think they assessed how much they wrote back. So in the response to the student, like, you should do this, you should think about this. Yeah. Hypothesis? Okay. All right, I am going to cut you off right there. Does a group that has not run across this study before, 
Is there a group that has not run across this study before? Okay. Do we have a hypothesis? Do either, either of these two groups want to offer your hypothesis that you came to? Okay. Any similar or different? Thank you. Are there similar or different hypotheses? Okay, a different one? Um, we thought that higher ability would be higher for male students, but that both competence and mentoring would be higher for females. Okay, so higher ability, higher for males, but competence and the amount of mentoring offered higher for females. Okay. Different hypothesis? Thank you. Okay, and Leslie's group saying all three higher for males. So it's this kind of different ranks of how depressing is this going to be? <laughs> the answer is C, the most depressing. Um, in every case, male and female professors were rating John as more competent, John as more hireable, and offered more mentorship to John than Jennifer. They wrote more to them, they offered more to them. All right, and you may be evaluating the study. How much do you believe it? Someone actually did a study about how do STEM faculty <laughs> evaluate studies about gender biases. <laughs> so they took this abstract, which is the abstract from the study, from the data that we just looked at, and they showed it to a bunch of male and female STEM faculty, and they showed it to a bunch of male and female non-STEM faculty, so faculty in non-STEM fields. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you one minute. Okay, you have a quick amount of time to talk about this because I wanna keep going, to hypothesize which faculty would evaluate this research as being the best quality, or they really do believe these results, which faculty would give it the lowest evaluation? And we have four kinds of faculty, male STEM, male non-STEM, female STEM, female non-STEM. Take one minute. I'm going to cut you off right there. And for the sake of time, and because I don't have a random call list and I didn't hand out popsicle sticks, I'm going to give you the spoiler. Male STEM faculty evaluated the research the worst. They gave it a very low evaluation compared to anybody else. Female STEM faculty evaluated it the highest. They had no doubt that this is true. I don't know why they would. The non-STEM faculty were right in the middle, right? They didn't rate it as high as the STEM faculty, the female STEM faculty, I'm sorry. They didn't rate it as low as the male STEM faculty, but there was no gender difference between how they evaluated it. I just wanna go through two more just to really rail this into your heads. <laughs> 6,500 professors were emailed 
asking for a research opportunity. This is another audit study. So identical email. Everything about what was sent to these professors was the same, but they changed the names to be very stereotypically white male or very stereotypically black male or white female or Asian female, right? All these different identities that it could be. And they looked to see who elicited a response. White male names more than anyone else get a response when asking for a research opportunity, right? Identical email. This was done by my, some of my colleagues at the University of Washington, where they went in and they listened to who was actually speaking in biology classrooms. And they looked across 13 classrooms. They took random samples from the days and they listened, okay, when a volunteer is being called on by the instructor, right? This is our behavior we can even think about now, right? When we're in front of someone and we're calling on names, we have the power to decide who's speaking. These classes all tend to be around 60% female, so what we're seeing here are these gray bars. The black bars here are representing what percent in each of these 13 classes are the percent of times the voices are actually female. When we average it across all of them, we find that females are speaking up way less often than we would expect, given how many of them there are in this class. Right? The voices that we hear in the classroom when someone's volunteering a response are male. Yeah, right, there's some classes. Well, first of all, the best that we've done, the best that we've seen is about equitable, right? <laughs> the worst that we've seen is very not equitable in the male direction, right? We've never seen a class where females are just dominating the class. We don't know what the difference is. They've tried to figure out what is it about this class versus the other class, and at this point, from talking to Sarah Eddy, Sarah Burnell, Mary Pat, they are not entirely sure. Uh, this is the, la the last name is Milkman, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, were these all done at the same time during the course? The, the course? It was sampled throughout the whole course. So they randomly tried to make sure that they got beginning, middle, end of the course. Yeah. Uh, we just actually replicated this in another course. Same findings. Not that they've seen with the responses. We've seen some evidence of achievement, but we're not sure. This is a very ripe area of research, everybody. Like, <laughs> okay. So hopefully at this point you're at least thinking, okay, faculty hold biases. If I'm an undergraduate and I'm dealing with faculty, depending on what my identity is, my interaction with them is going to be different, right? That's not okay, okay? What we want to look at now is the other big piece of the social experience of undergraduate life, which is what are the students doing? What do the students think? Before I dive into the research, I just want to make sure that I recognize the incredible people that I get to work with. Um, I am here talking about this work, but I would not be here talking about this work if it wasn't for these five people. So I want to recognize Sarah Eddy, who is currently at the University of Texas at Austin, doing really cool stuff. Uh, Steve Goudreau, who is largely in charge of my ability to graduate <laughs> in the anthropology department. Um, ben Wiggins and Allison Crow, who are at University of Washington um, in the biology department. I believe Ben gave a talk here in some capacity a year or two ago. Um, and Sarah Burnell, who is currently at Arizona State University and who I'll actually be getting to work with this fall at Arizona State University. Um, so what we have done is fairly simple. This is a 10-week class. Okay, at the University of Washington, for 10 week quarters. You can imagine that these ominous green lightning bolts are four exams, and they are. The first week of the class, in these classes, students have an online reading quiz every day. At the end of one of those reading quizzes, we said, okay, for an extra point, just tell us, in this class, who do you think is going to be particularly strong at understanding this class material? So give us your prediction coming into this class. Who are going to be the really strong students? The first exam happens. They've had two weeks in the course. They've gotten to know each other a little bit better. They've been evaluated. They don't know what their exam grades are yet. And we ask them, 
please list any students in the class that you feel are particularly strong at understanding the class material. Okay, so now that you've been here, who do you know that's really strong at this stuff? After the second exam, after the third exam, after the fourth exam, or actually just before the fourth exam, we ask them the same question. We end up with something that's called longitudinal network data. We have data that are connecting entities to each other, and we have it happening in sequence. We have it over a course of time. I want to tell you a little bit about the courses that we're working with. Um, these are three iterations of the same introductory biology course. This is at the University of Washington. The University of Washington, there are three in the intro series, so they have the first bio, second bio, third bio. This was the second biology course in the series of three. So the students come in, most of them having already taken the first course with one another. So there's some familiarity with each other. These classes are huge. Uh, the first one that we did this in was 196 students, but then we went into a 759 student class and a 760 student class. I'm currently looking at a 1200 student class. Um, yeah, they are very, very, very large lectures there. Uh, to give you an idea of what the demographics look like in these classes, uh, it's about 58.1% female in the biology department. So the biology department at University of Washington, undergraduates mostly female. Mostly white, mostly Asian. We have a large international population. Um, and then smaller numbers of underrepresented minorities, Latino, Latinas, Native Americans, and black students. So what we can do, we ask, the, we ask the students all these questions, and then we want to do something with these data. We want to understand what's going on. There's two things that are really cool that we can do, even more probably. We can visualize these data with something called a sociograph, which I'll introduce you to. And then we can start modeling the importance of gender uh, to who students are listing. So I'm going to introduce you to a sociograph. This is a sociograph. We call each of these circles a node. And this, we can say, are six students. And depending on what you're researching, these could be six different organizations. These could be three different cities, th six different countries. Sorry, six different cities, six different countries. But here we're going to say these are students. One, two, three, four, five, six. This right now doesn't tell us much. Perhaps we ask them, who do you think is strong in the class material? And then we can see who is listing who. So here we can see that student number one has an arrow to student number two, which means student number one said student number two is strong in the course material. Nobody said student number six was strong in the course material, but student number six also didn't say anybody else was. Two people said student number three was strong in the course material, but student number three didn't mutually nominate anyone else, so on and so forth. OK, this is kind of cool. It can get cooler if we can actually see who are these students. Can you tell me something about their identity? We can do that by throwing some color on it. So now these green circles, these green nodes, are going to represent male students, while these reddish orange nodes are going to represent female students. So now we can start understanding, OK, so where are the males, where are the females on this? What we really want to know, though, is who are the students that are getting nominated a lot? Who are the students that are really prestigious? So what we can do is we can make the size of that node correlate with how many people nominated that student. And now it becomes a little clearer that students number one, students number five, and students number six, no one nominated, they're very small. Student four and student two, one person nominated, they're a little bit larger. And student number three, who had two nominations the most, is the largest circle. So this is a nice way to start exploring what our data are telling us. So what happens in week one when we ask 760 or 750 students to tell us, who do you think is strong with the course material? It looks like this. And this is fun. We can notice a lot of different features. First, a lot of students know each other. Right? This looks like a big bush here. There's a lot of people who know each other. There are a lot of people that aren't listing anybody and a lot of people that aren't being listed. And there seem to be some people that are bigger circles than others, but nothing that's too drastic or that we can really read into too much. So let's fast forward two weeks to the first exam. We now look like this. Oh, just wait. <laughs> All of a sudden, we start seeing some pattern, right? We start seeing, OK, well, 
this person, somebody that a lot of people think is pretty good with the material, this person is, this person is, they're all green. After the second exam, looks like this. And the last time that we were able to collect a network in those classes was after the third exam, at which point it now looks like this. Yeah, we call, I like to call these the celebrities. 52 students were able to type this student's name into a box and say, yeah, I think the student's really strong in the course material. But this wouldn't be too worrisome because this is one class. It could just be these three students that are just so outstanding and happen to be male in this one class. So let's look at a different class where I've done this. Let's go back. Let's look at the 196 student class at the exact same time in the course. Keep in mind, this class was 55.4% female, so it's not that there are more males. So the circles in each time point, so if I were to go back and forward, the circles are moving in each one. They're not stationary. I've tried keeping, like you can keep them stationary, but what happens is that the lines are just so mixed up that it becomes kind of hard to read. So instead it just positions each network to be the most readable. Yeah. So class A, we look like this. Okay, this is 56% female again all of our largest circles, males. And the most recent that we've analyzed through was this one, which doesn't look as bad. We still, this is now 58.4% female, this was the most numerically majority female we've done this in, but we still have our most well-known students are male. Okay, so I think we have a first result that kind of jumps out at this. So we actually looked, okay, well, who are the most well-known students? And what we find is that at the end of every class, our biggest celebrity students are male. Masa? Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, so what we're finding, and this is pretty drastic. Like in class B, the most well-known female had nine students list her. The most well-known male had 52. The second most well-known male had 20. The third most well-known male had 18. The third most well-known male was twice as well-known as the most well-known female in that class. When we look at class A, the most well-known female had eight nominations. The most well-known male had twice those nominations, right? It's, she comes in fifth place as far as being well-known. And the last class, which looks okay, still has right, three males before we see a female. This class is 58% female. In the back. These are such good questions. Can we, we're going right there. <laughs> we have one other question. Uh, I don't want to tell you what that is because I want you to think about this right now. Um, the next thing that we can do, and this is where it gets really powerful, is we can actually statistically model inequity. We can model the system, like how did we arrive on this exact network? What is important for students to be nominated? What is an important feature for a student to be someone nominating? So we can test the effect of gender on who is being nominated. But what we need to do is we need to control for a whole bunch of other things that we think may be confounding the study. So what I want you to do, and we have 10 minutes until 2.30, so I'm gonna give you again like a minute and a half, is design what, tell me what variables do you want to know about these classrooms that will help you predict what is going on in these networks. So for instance, we just mentioned grade. One thing that you may want to know is the grade of these students. Think about other things that you may want to know. I'm going to give you one minute, 30 seconds.
All right, there's kind of a natural toning down, so I'm going to cut everybody off right there. Does someone from a group that has not spoken yet today want to volunteer what their group talked about? Yeah. Yeah, so how outspoken are they? So how, who's speaking up in class? Okay. So who's speaking up? Over here. Picking up on something from earlier in your talk, I want to know the self-efficacy that individual students have about themselves. The self-efficacy about themselves? In terms of their ability to file. Mm-hmm. They're self-rating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we had a comment here. Faculty recognition. Faculty recognition. Who are faculty calling out, right? Who are they giving that praise to? Use praise caut cautiously, perhaps. Um, one more. Mm-hmm. All right. Y'all absolutely kicked my butt on this. I want to know all those things. We didn't capture all of them. What we are able to capture in these studies, we have student performance. We know their grades. We know who's actually good at biology, right? This is what should be used. If this is a meritocracy and what students are doing, this should really be the one and only thing. We know who's speaking up in class, sort of. After the class is over, we just went to the instructor, didn't tell them why we were asking them this, but we told them, go through this class list for me and just tell me if the student was speaking a lot in class. Like, figure out which students were really outspoken. Think about the ones that were really quick to raise their hands, ask a question, tell a wrong answer, tell a right answer. We don't care. If they were vocal and noticeable, we want to know. We call this outspokenness. That speech bubble represents if that student was listed as outspoken. We are able to capture the structure of the class. Students aren't going to be able to list students that they don't know. So what we want to do is make sure that we're controlling for their smaller circle. These classes met in 24, hour, in 24 student smaller labs for two and a half hours a week. We know that this is where their friends are, and this is where they make friends, and this is where they get to know each other really well. So we're able to control for this. And the other thing is we can control for the actual structure of the network. We want to control for the fact that there are a lot of people out there who aren't nominating anyone and no one's nominating them. That gives us a better prediction about what we see. And we want to control for the fact that if I nominate you, Leslie, Leslie, you're more likely to nominate me. Because we probably know each other. We probably work with each other. So we can control for all these things. And then we can put gender in our model. And we can say, OK, well, what's the importance of gender after we've kind of done what we think should be going on in this network? I'm going to explain this plot to you, and then I'm going to have you interpret it. These bars represent class A at times 2 and 3. These are the two times that we were able to get data in that one. This is class B at times 1, 2, 3, 4. This is class C at times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So each of these is a longitudinal set throughout that class. This y-axis is the proportion of nominations that are going to males. So what proportion of nominations are going to males? The orange bars represent from female. The green bars represents from male. This is controlling for grade. This is controlling for outspokenness. This is controlling for structure. This is controlling for lab sections. 
I want you to try to decipher what is going on in this class, or these three classes. So I'm going to give you, again, probably one minute. So these are 95% confidence intervals on parameter, basically coefficient estimates in the model. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have two minutes until 2.30. So I want to keep rushing through now. So I'm going to unfortunately cut everybody off. Did our groups tend to notice that males are always <laughs> rating their males more than you would expect by merit and outspokenness and by structure? And did you notice that females, on a few occasions, were biased towards their female peers. So on three occasions, we actually see some evidence that females are actually nominating their female peers a little more. But do you also notice this kind of as time goes on trend, where it goes higher and higher and higher? Yeah. So we kind of see as the class goes on, males right, are getting this deference. They're getting this kind of this prestige from their peers more so than their females. So what we can actually think about now is, okay, well, what are males doing compared to females? How are they doing their nominations? And from what we've seen, when we look at how females are doing their nominations, when a female student looks at a female student and a male student, she's doing this equitably. She's saying, okay, well, I'm going to look at what I think your grade is, what you're outspoken, like are you speaking up in class, do I know you, all these things, those really predict well without knowing their gender if a female is going to nominate a peer. When we look at what males are doing, they're <laughs> over-nominating their peers. And we want to get an understanding of, okay, well, just how much are they over-nominating their peers, right? We want to get an understanding of what is that size. So what we can do is we can compare the importance of GPA to all of our students in evaluating their peers and compare it to the importance of gender to male students when making their evaluation. And we can say, okay, well, what would the GPA difference have to be between a male student and a female student for that male student to have the same likelihood of nominating the female student as the male student? Because that's how we could achieve some equity. That size is a 0.76 GPA difference. This is a really big difference. Males are giving a boost to their male peers that is equivalent to a 0.76 GPA difference. This is a boys club. This is a total boys club. So this is concerning, right? Like immediately it's just be like, I'm concerned, but let's dissect. Why should we be concerned? Let's think back to what we talked about with our self-efficacy and the importance of those social interactions that we have. This was an anonymous right, online survey, or a confidential online survey. Right? Students were not necessarily sharing with their peers, hey, I listed you. They may have, we don't know. But this may be reflecting a lot of the things that are going on with students when they're in a study group. Where does the deference go when we're debating between where the right answer is? I'm gonna go with you male student, because I think you know it better, because I think you're stronger than material, right? There may be these really subtle cues going on that may be eroding self-efficacy. And even if it's really subtle, what you want to think about is they meet in this class four days a week, right? They're studying for this class 
hopefully every day, they're going to chemistry class. They're probably going to calculus class. They're probably going to physics. If they're experiencing these gentle nudges consistently, right, if you're seeing this difference in deference, this can really erode away at what your self-efficacy is. And as we know, right, we have this leaky pipeline. Perhaps we shouldn't call it a leaky pipeline. Perhaps this is really more of a selective filter. Maybe the system is set up where we're just filtering things out by what's going to happen. The other thing, and I'm introducing this word implicit bias. Kimberly said earlier, unconscious bias. These are very much the same. We don't think students are sitting down to the survey and saying, OK, I'm going to list my male students. They're thinking about, OK, who's the strong student? And they just happen to list more males. What we think is really going on is that these students tend to have this implicit bias, something underneath our conscience that just kind of, kind of alters how our behavior works. They once asked a whole classroom of kindergartners, draw what a scientist looks like. They all drew the same thing. A white male, crazy white hair, explosion in the background. Right? This is what a scientist is. We grow up with this conception. We know that faculty have a lot of implicit biases. These have been un, um, revealed. What's scary is that these millennial students at the University of Washington over the past four years or so also have implicit biases. They're students today. In 10 years, they're going to be doctors. They're going to be faculty. They're going to be making hiring decisions. Right? We cannot just rely on, OK, well, the new generation with all of our new cultural norms are not going to have implicit biases. Right? This, is, this is not just going to go away, because time lets it go away. You may all be sitting there thinking the exact same thing that I have been thinking for the past three or so years. <laughs> <laughs> this is depressing. This is a really depressing talk. And this is how I felt for a long time. And I've recently finally come to the conclusion that this is depressing. But it's another thing. This is empowering. Right? This is key. We didn't know this. But now we do know this. And if we want equity, and we want diversity, we need to go in and figure out why we don't have it. The more we know, and the more we understand these social influences in the classroom, the better that we can address these issues that we see. So I originally was, I was, I didn't know if I wanted to do a what can we do slide. And I don't know if I need one, because Kimberly just did this slide for an incredible hour of what can we do. I do want to elaborate on a couple of things. I want to talk to you quickly about random call. So this is the popsicle stick idea, where we kind of randomize voices. In class C, that class where it wasn't as bad. We don't know why it wasn't as bad. But we have a couple things that we think may be going on. Random call in that class was used a lot more. Much higher use of random call. That's not a conclusion, but it's a lead to do some more research. There, was, there were three instructors in that class. And this was the only class where there was someone in front of the class that was not a male. One of the, four, or one of the three instructors in that class was a female. So there was female representation on the stage. <coughs> Again, we don't know, but it's something that we should be thinking about. But random call, we know that this can eliminate gender biases. In that study that I showed you by Sarah Eddy, Sarah Brunel, Mary Pat Wenderoff, they also investigated what random call did to those classes. And when random call was used, it was random. It was exactly what you wanted. We can eliminate this participation gap if we can get comfortable and figure out how to successfully get more voices in our classrooms. We found some success with this at the University of Washington. I've talked to colleagues at different institutions that struggle with it. This is, it is, it's a very sensitive thing to do and it takes a lot of tact and art, but it's something that we can start thinking about. Um, I'm not gonna put other things up here because again, you now have a checklist of 20 things that probably help this. I do wanna point out that we need to be aware of our own biases. And I mean this in the classroom, and I mean this when we're making decisions. I mean this as citizens, right? We need to be aware of our own biases, and we need to be aware of the biases in our classroom. It's OK to have biases. It's OK to have an implicit bias. It's not your fault, right? You grew up where you grew up. You experience what you experience. You associate things with what you associate things. It doesn't make you a bad person. 
being aware of them and making sure that you check yourself once in a while does make you a better person though, right? That kind of helps you bring some diversity and make sure that you're not letting things make your decisions that you don't want making your decisions. I'm gonna reiterate, I love this paper. Um, I, whenever I like people talk to me about this and ask what can I do, it's not just because Kimberly's here, I literally give them this paper. Um, I love this paper, go through it, you have that checklist, please use it. I wanna go through some takeaways. Um, first of all, current students in the classroom have biased opinions of their peers. There's a lot of research coming out now that not just of their peers, but there are a lot of studies coming out showing teacher evaluations. If you are a male instructor, you get better evaluations because you're a male instructor than you would if you were a female instructor, right? These are more evidence of biases in our undergraduate students. It kind of makes you think, okay, well, should we use these for anything? Are they useful at all if identity matters to how they're giving you merit? This is really important. These biases are hidden, right? I did not know this was gonna happen. When I started collecting these data, I was not interested in doing a gender study. I had the data and I was exploring the data for another project and I was like, oh my gosh, what is happening? We need to study this, right? If you are in front of a classroom, there may be things going on that you're not aware of. You have the power to look at things, right? You can collect data as an instructor, you don't need to publish it, but it can inform your own practice and that's really important to know that you can do that. Every classroom is different. You need to keep in mind there's a huge limitation on this study. It was one university. It was one intro bio classroom. We did it three times. That is not really a big number, n equals three. That's our population size here. We don't know what it looks like at different institutions in different fields when there's a female instructor, when there's a male instructor, when pedagogy differs. There's a whole slew of questions to ask about what's going on. Given that biology is 60% female, I would imagine that this is a conservative case across STEM fields. We can't be sure, but that would be my hypothesis going in. But we don't know, right? This is important to keep in mind. And again, I wanna reiterate, this is our job, right? As citizens, as instructors, to be cognizant of these things that are going on, because it's our job to address them. With that, I wanna thank you for listening. I wanna thank all of the students that have been involved in this study. They have answered so many questions for us. Um, and I think it's a lot of nagging work for them, but we really appreciate it. And at this point, it is 2.40, so I don't know if it's open questions for everybody or how we wanna do this, but thank you. Okay. Thank you.